Banjo Kazooie. Boy, do I have a lot of memories with this Nintendo 64 platformer. One with a very interesting development cycle that I won't go super deep into, but to put in summary, this somehow turned into this, then a bear showed up, then the developers were like, give him a backpack, put a bird in it. Perfect. And boom, you got 1998's Banjo-Kazooie. A revolutionary game that had some of the best visuals on the N64 for the time and also helped further the sheer popularity of the 3D platformer craze that Super Mario 64 is responsible for pioneering. The game was met with enormously positive critical reception and went on to sell over 3.5 million copies worldwide. Many reviews at the time went on about how it was a much more attractive and fluid game compared to the legendary Mario 64. Not only did the game leave a massive impact, but so did the titular characters themselves. In fact, let's talk about them a little bit. Banjo, our main hero, is a kind and gentle bear. You know, just like most bears. <laughs> One might call him a little bit of a simpleton, but he's willing to do what it takes to get his sister back. Kazooie, who lives in Banjo's backpack, is... Uh, we don't really know what their relationship is. Are they roommates? Is she a pet? Perhaps they have a thing going on? Now that I have that horrifying image in my head, let's just talk about her instead. She is very snarky, sassy, and always has something rude to say, and always provides a good laugh while talking to NPCs. She ultimately wants to help Banjo out, but that doesn't mean she has to be nice about it. The two have a really fun dynamic and bounce off of each other really well when it comes to dialogue and especially gameplay, but more on that later. A lot of people still love them to this day, so much so that somewhat recently they were put into Super Smash Bros. Ultimate due to the fan outcry, despite not being in a main and game of their own since 2000... Alright, enough of the history lesson. Let's get into the actual game. Let's start off with this game's deep and rich narrative. <sighs> I'm kidding. All that happens is that Banjo's sister, Tootie, gets kidnapped by one of gaming's greatest villains. Oh, we'll get to her soon enough. To use a machine to steal Tootie's looks and become the prettiest of them all. Well, I don't know, I'd say she's already pretty beautiful with her, uh green face and uh, anyway so banjo and his backpack pal kazooie pursue the witch and climb the many layers of her lair to save banjo's sister as they travel up the lair they need to enter special portals and doorways that take them to a variety of different worlds where they need to collect special jigsaw pieces called jiggies as well as music notes to help them progress through the lair Along the way, the buddy duo is helped out by Bottles the Mole, who hides in almost every world who, once you find, teaches you new moves free of charge. Not that you would know that, based on Kazooie's interactions with him. The two are also helped by a crazy witch doctor... man... named Mumbo, who helps you after you cough up some Mumbo tokens. What establishment in this world exchanges goods and services for Mumbo tokens? How on earth did this seemingly random shaman man get a currency named after him? Is this part of that deep Banjo-Kazooie lore? When is Rare gonna release the Isle of Hags Historia? Am I looking too deep into a simple mechanic in a children's game? Probably not, honestly. I'm watching you, Mumbo. If come, oh come. Anyway, we're getting off track here. You exchange the Mumbo tokens in order to gain access to transformations which are usually used to get one or two jiggies in a particular world. There are other friendly and not so friendly NPCs along the way. Fuck you, Mr. Vile, and your bullshit minigame that you have to play three times to get one jiggy. Every time you lose, he takes a bite out of you. If you lose too many times, you die, and then you have to do them all over again, and it's, mm, it's so annoying. The NPCs usually give you a short task or quest in order to get more stuff, but they don't tend to amount to much more than that. Speaking of unfriendly NPCs, let's talk about one of, if not the best character in this game, Gruntilda the Witch. Grunty for short. She is honestly the perfect video game antagonist who just makes you love to hate her by the end. Okay, so your initial motivation is to save your kidnapped sister. I mean, okay, whatever, Princess Peach number 7089, but you want some real motivation? Have you ever been called mean names? It hurts, okay? Throughout the entire game, Grunty bullies and insults you. 
in rhyme every time. Here is a couple of my favorites if you want some examples. You get so sick of her rhyming by the end of the game that you just want nothing more than to kick her ass by the end. And uh, get Tootie back, I guess. Perfect video game villain. She alone is a great motivator to get you to the end in case the gameplay alone doesn't do it for you. Speaking of which, let's get into that. So like I mentioned before, Banjo is a 3D collectathon platformer very similar to Super Mario 64 or Super Mario Odyssey for a more modern example. The entire goal of the game is to explore large open worlds and find things to further your progress. The main collectibles are jigsaw pieces called jiggies that I mentioned earlier, which are required to open more worlds. There are a total of 100 in the game, 90 hidden in the worlds and 10 hidden in Grunty's lair. They are required because you need to fill in these jigsaw puzzles to open more worlds and more importantly open the final door before the final encounter, so in total you're gonna need at least 94 jiggies to beat the game, but at that point you might as well get all 100. I'll go more into that later. There are also 5 hidden Jinjos in every world, collect all 5 and you get a jiggy. Pretty straightforward. The other main collectible that you need to get to beat the game are the music notes. There are a total of 900 notes in the game all scattered throughout the worlds, 100 in each. Grunty's lair is filled with all of these note doors throughout, each of them requiring you to have a specific amount of notes to proceed. I believe you need roughly around 850 or so to beat the game, but you should get around 884 or so, which I'll also get back to later. Remember earlier when I said Bottles teaches you new moves? Well, he is hidden throughout each level, and unless I'm mistaken, you need to find all of his molehills to beat the game. Not that they're ever too hard to find. He teaches Kazooie how to shoot and poop eggs. Did I just say poop? N never mind. He can also teach Kazooie how to fly using these flight pads, and also teach her how to jump really high using these green launch pads. He even teaches Kazooie how to stick her legs out of the bottom of Banjo's backpack and run faster than the bear himself. She can also use golden feathers to turn invincible, get super fast running shoes, special boots that help her wade through dangerous terrain, attack while in midair with the beak bomb. Wow, this is very one-sided. Our main protagonist might as well be a pack mule. He doesn't learn anything new in the entire game, but I guess he takes all the hits for them, and he does most of the walking, so he puts in some work, I guess. He'll get a little redemption in the next game, anyway. The last main collectibles to worry about are the empty honeycombs. Banjo's health bar is made up of honeycombs, because he's a bear. <laughs> if you collect six empty honeycombs, you will expand your health bar by one honeycomb. And man, these are the hardest things to find. I've been playing this game for years, and I've never been able to find all the empty honeycombs. Granted, I never really tried that hard, but that's beside the point. They are devious little buggers, but they are very useful to get, as dying is very brutal in this game. On the N64, anyway. Let's go a little bit more into the note system of this game real quick. So like I mentioned earlier, each world contains 100 notes that you need to collect in order to unlock note doors. This is a fairly straightforward task, but here's the kicker. If you die or leave the world, only your note score is saved. And if you return or respawn after dying, then every note in that world respawns. What does this mean? This means that the game only saves whatever your highest note score in each world is. Meaning that if you don't get all 100 notes in a particular world without dying, you have to do it all over again if you are planning on getting them all in that world. <laughs> Luckily, everything else that you collect except Jinjos are permanent and will not be taken away if you die. What a brutal punishment for death in what is otherwise a friendly, happy-go-lucky kids game. Imagine getting 99 notes and then you just die and you have to do it all over again. Not that that has ever happened to me or anything. This is thankfully all fixed in the Xbox 360 remaster for the game by making everything you collect permanent as soon as you get it, making the second half of the game much more lax and in my opinion more enjoyable. I do sort of wish they gave an option to use note scores as a hard mode or original mode or something, but either way, this alone makes it the superior version to play. Even with note scores though, they aren't a super big problem in the first 5 or 6 worlds as they aren't super tough, but man, world 7 through 9 can be pretty brutal, especially world 8. 
Speaking of worlds, let's go into each and every one of them a little bit. The first world is Mumbo's Mountain. Oh, I get it. A currency named after him wasn't good enough, so they had to get a mountain named after him too. Well, more like a small hill, but whatever. Anyway, this is a very easy and straightforward level that can honestly take like 10 or 15 minutes to beat if you know what you're doing. The challenges aren't tough and all the jiggies are all wide open. It's a very easy tutorial area. Treasure Trove Cove is the next world and it's also my favorite world in the game. I always love beach settings and games and I just can't get enough of this music. The world is much larger than Mumbo's Mountain and requires more than an ounce of brain power to complete. You have to find buried treasure, help out a gross hippo, kill this crab, and his children, and you even get to poop with a bucky! Yeah! You even get to experience what it's like to avoid certain death by swimming away from the shark while creepy Jaws music plays. <laughs> This is also where you learn how to fly, which is just super fun to do. Overall, great level. The next level is Clanker's Cavern, which is probably my least favorite in the game for more reason than the fact that it's just an underwater level. Okay, that's a decent chunk of it. I always just kind of get lost here, especially when it comes to going inside the titular metal whale himself. A lot of his chambers all look very similar to one another, and the swimming controls are fine and all when the camera is free and just following behind you, but they expect you to swim at some pretty awkward angles, and it's just really annoying. I still overall enjoy the level, but it's one of the weakest in the game for me. Next up is Bubble Gloop Swamp, another good level with some awesome music. Fun fact, this is the only level in the game where you can truly say that the floor is lava. Outside of the board game, but trust me, we'll get to that later. This level has a wide variety of things to do, and you even get to transform into a freaking alligator. Sweet! Not only do you break this turtle's legs, but you also get to destroy all the inhabitants' huts. What, they aren't home? Who cares? Fun fact, this is also the level where you get to play the Mr. Vile minigame, which is just... It's just good, you know? It's just my favorite. It's just... It, it, on to Freeze Easy Peak. Another fantastic level that is just so much fun to move around and explore in. After you learn the Beak Bomb, anyway. So you can kill all these stupid snowmen so they stop throwing freaking snowballs at you. Stop it! Not only do you get to terrorize this innocent walrus, but you also get to save Christmas! You even get to become a walrus yourself and not do much other than rob the guy you already terrorized. Our heroes, ladies and gentlemen. You also even get the opportunity to climb up a giant snowman and ride down on a sled and land on top of this innocent bystander. And uh, I don't think he's breathing, so let's just uh, get out of here and uh, go to Gobi's Valley. What do you say? Gobi's Valley. This is a large desert area that is somehow actually not super boring like most desert levels. It's actually really fun and has some light puzzle solving and fun skill-based jiggies like this one where you have to race to the top of this pyramid before the door closes. The timer is surprisingly tight, so it might take a couple tries. Once you're done terrorizing a camel, not once, not twice, but three times, I swear I never realized how awful our heroes were until writing this script. We can head into Mad Monster Mansion. The world may seem kind of small at first, but it is jam-packed with secret areas and other nook and crannies. The developers really made a lot of use out of this cramped space. I prefer more open and spacious design in this type of game normally, so this isn't my favorite world, but it's still pretty good overall. Even if that's mostly just due to the theme of giving off those Halloween vibes. This is also the first world where I'd say that note score will start making you sweat, so if that spooks you, then just play the modern remaster. After that, let's head to Rusty Bucket Bay. 
which is widely considered to be the hardest level in the game for a few reasons. It's big, there's a lot of hidden areas, the water is all oily and makes you start drowning even if you're at the surface of it, and makes you drown twice as fast underwater, but the biggest reason why this is considered the hardest level of the game is due to the infamous engine room. This is pretty much the only area in the entire game with a bottomless pit. This is one of the only areas in the game where the game puts less focus on the exploration and more focus on the platform nature of this platformer. Go figure. There is timing and little room for error, and I really hope you don't make the same mistake that my childhood self did on his first playthrough, and come here last after collecting every other note and jiggy in the level, and then immediately die, and then having to find all of the notes over again. Once again, the modern version improves this by getting rid of the note score. This level is actually pretty fun in the modern version, and not too stressful. You will probably die a couple times, but death is a slap on the wrist in this version of the game, so it's not that bad. On the N64 though, this was definitely my least favorite level just due to how difficult it was. Also, fun fact, this is the only world in the entire game that has a boss fight. It's super easy, but it's there, I guess. Now, the last level is probably gonna be some big epic lava filled death zone with buzz saws, right? Nope, it's just one big tree called Click Clock Wood, and it's also one of the best worlds in the game. The thing that really makes it stand out from the rest of the levels in this game is that there are four different versions of the level representing all four seasons. Due to this fact, this is the longest world in the game as many of the jiggies require you to do different tasks throughout multiple seasons, some even all four. The level really tests everything you've learned so far and is no holds barred in terms of length and size. For anyone that has played Banjo-Tooie, I've always considered this level to be a beta Tooie level just due to how big it is. The first world in this game will take most players about 20 minutes maximum. This world can easily take up to 2 or 3 hours, especially if you don't know what you're doing. I enjoy a lot of the tasks though, like having to hatch and feed this bird Airy. It's just really cool to watch him grow into a giant eagle by the end of the game. I also like helping this beaver guy. He runs into his house, which you can't access in that season, and then you have to go into a different season where he says he's waited months for you to show up. Meaning that these two are basically just Marty McFly and Doc Brown. Great Scott. It's whatever, you know, just some casual time travel. They'll add that in the Isle of Hags historia, I'm sure. After terrorizing this poor camel one more time, Banjo and Kazooie are able to climb to the top of Grunty's lair and play a totally fun and fair board game that isn't even remotely frustrating in order to win Tootie back. Let's quickly get into the worst part of the game. Meet Bruntilda, who is Grunty's nicer sister. She is hidden throughout Grunty's lair and will tell you facts about Grunty, which at first seems like it's just supposed to be a little fun, humorous thing to read every once in a while, but what the game doesn't tell you is that you need to know these facts, as some of the questions in this board game will be about these. And it's not like you can just look up the answers online because they are all randomized every time. So you can either do what I usually do and slam my head against a brick wall and hope to god you guess correctly until you win, or go back through the entire lair and find Brintilda and write everything she says down. This is by far the worst thing in the entire game, as nothing in the game warns you about this prior, but it's also not even that fun to begin with. The rest of the board game asks you questions about things you've actually done and seen, and about characters you've actually met. That's actually fun, it's just asking you to recall events and moments that you actually did. Overall, the board game is a cool idea, but the grunty questions really ruin it for me. After you eventually win and get Tootie back, Grunty runs away and then the credits play? What? No ass kicking? Nah, it's a fake out credit. 2D tells Banjo to get off his bum and go take out Grunty. After that, they go back and confront the witch in what is honestly one of my favorite boss fights in all of gaming. She has five different phases that test all of the abilities you have learned in the game. It's a tough fight, which is why I recommended you might as well just get 100% of the jiggies and notes earlier. Because by doing so, you can double your health bar, making the fight much more... bearable for first time players. You're gonna need some quick reflexes and you need to be aware of everything you have in your arsenal. Oh, Grunty is shooting an undodgeable attack at you? Use the Wonder Wing. She's flying around in the air? Use the Beak Bomb. She's just standing there? Shoot eggs at her. 
This is all topped off by an amazing final boss theme. In the end, Banjo and Kazooie call upon the mighty Ginginator to knock Grunty off the top of her lair and get stuck under a boulder, putting an end to her evil deeds. And her rhyming. Thank God. Banjo and friends all take a well-deserved break and are even told by Mumbo that they will be getting a sequel. Rare was confident in this game, jeez. So all in all, this is definitely one of my favorite games of all time. I have so many fond memories of this game, I just love the exploration and platforming and everything. It's so much fun to replay, and I will always be nostalgic for these two, and I am sad that they haven't returned in their own game since 2008. Just to show how much nostalgia I have for this short-lived series, I literally actually cried when they were revealed in Smash Ultimate at E3 2019. Unfortunately, I didn't record myself at the time as I had no clue it was happening, but trust me, it did happen. If you find yourself interested in playing this after watching this video, I highly recommend the Xbox 360 Remaster, which is available on 360 obviously, as well as Xbox One through the Rare Replay Collection, which is just a great deal. Thanks for watching, and fuck Sonic Forces.